Well, hello again, and welcome to another episode. Today we have with us Carly Burns. She is a holistic mental wellness coach who empowers high achievers to naturally heal their mind so they can overcome anxiety, step into self-love and confidence, and feel like themselves again. She's a self-proclaimed mental warrior, I love that, and has mastered living with anxiety, depression, ADHD, and bipolar disorder, all without medication. Carly is on a mission to teach you how to do the same and make your mind your superpower. I love that bio. Welcome, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay, so tell us a little bit more. Just tell us kind of how you got started doing what you're doing. And obviously, you've had a lot to deal with and you've done it quite well. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so I mean, to try and make a, a very long life story a little bit shorter, um, essentially, I grew up quite crippled by my own mind, um, really struggled with anxiety and depression, not knowing that I had those diagnoses, um, ADHD as well. And when I was 19, I was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And at that point, my whole world changed because before that I'd been really coping by using substances. I was very heavily dependent on cannabis and alcohol. And, you know, I used to to want to run a lot, but more with the intention of being skinny and not because I actually really cared about being healthy um, until I received my diagnosis. And then I was like, okay, I have two choices here. I have three choices, really. I can continue on this path that I'm on of being totally unwell and probably end up in the system and, you know, on and off the streets, on and out, and out of hospitals. And that's, that's not a direction that I want to go. I can choose to take the medication that I'm being offered or I can find a third way to manage this. So that's what I did. I went on a really deep healing journey and started really diving into the neuroscience of what it means to heal your mind, what that actually looks like in a practical sense, and then applying that and experiencing it. So it didn't take long, about a year into my journey, when I had really figured out like a self-care routine that works for me, I did my yoga teacher training that year. I started really immersing myself in the outdoors, which always involved exercise as well. Um, you know, I started tuning into my sleep patterns and really prioritizing that, making sure I was getting enough nutrition. And when I had kind of figured all this out and I was, you know, mentally stable and happy and fulfilled, I looked back on my life and thought, wow, I'm so young. I was 20 years old at the time, having witnessed my dad go through a somewhat similar journey with his mental health, but he struggled for a lot longer than I did. He was in his mid fifties, maybe late fifties when he was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And right away for him, that meant a multitude of pills that he's taking every single day. I witnessed his journey. I looked at mine and I said, I've figured this out at such a young age. And I've found this alternative means of healing. I have to share this with the world. It would be selfish for me to not, you know, share this medicine. So it still took me quite a long time to actually start offering coaching. It's been, um, you know, I'm 27 now and all this happened when I was 19, 20, um, but I've continued on that journey, continued with my self-care practices. And now I'm guiding others to find healing in the profound ways that have transformed my life. Awesome. Well, that's a very good summary. So I'm just curious, did your, did your problems and struggles help your dad get diagnosed? Like when, Reverse order, actually. Um, okay. That was probably a little bit mild in my story, but no. So my dad was diagnosed when I was 17. I was about to graduate high school um, and there was a lot of turmoil in our household. He and I, again, growing up, both of us undiagnosed with these illnesses, we were both very stubborn people. We had fairly mm -hmm. similar personalities and we did not get along. Um, we couldn't be in the same room together most of the time without screaming at each other. So that really contributed to like the you know, instability of my childhood and of my mental health, because I grew up believing I had a father who didn't love me and, you know, projected that as me being unworthy, unlovable, all these things that still to this day, I'm working through, even though like I can talk about it very openly because I know it's not true. It's just, there's still some, you know, deep seated stuff that happens with childhood trauma. Um, So my dad was actually diagnosed. Yeah. That, that summer. And then I received my first diagnosis fresh into university and I was diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, and depression. Now at that time, when I received these diagnoses, even though I already knew that I had struggled with anxiety and depression, even without having a formal diagnosis, ADHD was never on my radar. So receiving that, I really was stigmatizing myself and was really, you know, afraid of this idea that I might be 
quote, mentally ill. And, you know, I did take the medication for ADHD for about a month because I felt like that was my only option at the time. That's what the doctor said. I'm 18 years old. I'm drinking a lot of booze and trying to figure out how to navigate this university thing. And it's just, you know, it was, um, it was a really turbulent time in my life. And because my dad had just been diagnosed with bipolar and because of my relationship at that time with him, it became my biggest fear in the world that I also had bipolar because I was afraid that I would potentially portray the behaviors that I had witnessed in him. I was afraid that I would potentially one day treat my children the way that he had treated me. And I was just so scared that my mind could ever, could ever behave like that. So when I actually did receive my diagnosis of bipolar disorder, only about a year later, a year and a half, I guess, after that, um, it was like, I had just faced my biggest fear in the world. And mm -hmm. I realized I was absolutely fine. And that, you know, having this diagnosis and experiencing, you know, the fact that my mind has this ability to experience all different ranges of emotion does not change who I am. And it does not mean that I'm going to become someone who is angry and aggressive. And, you know, it's, I can choose how to work with my mind and move forward from this. And because I have this awareness, I'm never going to let it get to the point where I have the behaviors that my dad had when I was growing up. So it was actually a really, really beautiful thing for me to receive that diagnosis. And it was fully in part, in part because my dad was diagnosed a couple of years before. Right. So it, it's like, it didn't come as a shock to you. I mean, you were braced for it and ready for it, because, but it was a fear, but it's still, it's kind of, it's kind of the same thing. You, you hear it and you're like, oh no, I was hoping not, you know, but I love how you say you turn it into your superpowers because it's all about at that point, it's just a word. I mean, now you understand and now, you know, and now you can deal with it however you choose to deal with it. But mm -hmm. it's, you know, I love that you don't use it as an excuse. Like, Oh, I've got bipolar. That's why I snap at you. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in my manic phase, just leave it, get out of my way. And so talk a little bit about some of the, I mean, even as a child, you had to have developed your own coping skills for mm -hmm. your swings yeah so when i was a child the majority of the time i mean okay i was always a very hyper child at school um so you know as soon as i received my adhd diagnosis looking back i was like of course like how did we miss this i was so hyper but i think it's very common for girls to either not be diagnosed or be misdiagnosed um because we don't tend to be maybe as loud as the boys that are loud and have ADHD in the classroom. But I was definitely that kid who, you know, spoke out of term when I knew an answer to a question or was very enthusiastic about things. Like at, at my senior prom, I won the most enthusiastic award. And it's like, that is fully because of my ADHD that I was that, you know, enthusiastic about things and passionate. And that alone is one of the ways that I view my mental health as a superpower because even though at first when I was diagnosed, I, I thought this is horrible. I have this illness, like my life is over in thinking back so much of what makes me, me so much of my personality is because of, you know, my passion, my enthusiasm, my zest. And I completely attribute a lot of this to the fact that I have ADHD, which I don't necessarily consider a mental illness because I'm not, I'm not ill. I'm not struggling. It's just a part of the way that my brain works and that's totally okay. Um, so coping mechanisms when I was younger, it was just, I struggled a lot with the depression and I had to just, I guess, find ways to get myself out of bed and get to school. And probably I daydreamed a lot about, you know, moving out of my home and going to where the mountains are and going to connect with nature and experiencing these things, traveling the world, doing all these things that I really wanted to do when I was a child and didn't have the opportunity to. I would, I fantasized all the time and, um, you know, would write stories about myself and, uh, some boy at school I had a crush on and about how we were married and traveling the world and just like, you know, these sorts of things to kind of remove myself from the reality I was actually living in. Now, as I got older and started to actually live some of these dreams and I, you know, I did move out to where the mountains are. I moved across the country for uni and went to school in, in BC so I could connect with nature. And then I went down to New Zealand and went on student exchange and really deepened that connection. And this is where uh, I was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder three days before leaving for New Zealand. That's what kind of sparked the, um, the mania that, that warranted the diagnosis. Um, 
but my coping became a lot more of the self-care maintenance pieces, a lot more of the daily medicines, making sure that I'm moving my body every day to get that endorphin boost. If I'm starting to feel a little bit high, a little bit more towards the manic side, I exercise even harder because I have extra energy that I need to burn. Um, when I'm tending towards that side, I avoid stimulants. Like I don't drink caffeine anyways. I don't need it. You can see how quickly I speak anyway. I haven't had any caffeine today, but I do enjoy, you know, small amounts. Like I enjoy chai and I enjoy cacao, like healthy hot chocolate. Um, I enjoy matcha. So I don't drink coffee because I just get way too hyper and irritated and edgy. But if I'm tending towards feeling a little bit higher, I won't have any of those stimulating drinks. I'll avoid sugars. I'll do things that are more grounding and, you know, exercise harder, maybe go for a swim in the ocean, um, eat a big meal to try and almost like weigh me down a little bit to kind of bring me back to my baseline. And when it's the opposite side of I'm starting to feeling, I'm starting to feel a little bit lower, I'm still going to make myself move, but maybe not push as hard. Maybe it'll be more of a gentle walk and a stretch just to like make sure I'm still doing something with movement. I will have an extra thick cacao or, you know, two chais in a day um, to try and give myself that extra sort of stimulation um, and really put an effort into getting outside in the fresh air, seeing friends and connecting with community to make sure that I'm remaining uplifted and probably just allow myself more downtime to whether it's meditate, practice yoga, um, sleep a little bit extra, watch a movie. It's just, it's tuning into what my body is asking for without letting my mind kind of take over and say, stay in bed all day and just watch Netflix because I know right. that's not going to serve me tomorrow. So it's always right. about navigating where my baseline is and what do I actually need to, to hover right around that baseline. Right. Exactly. You, you said th something interesting because you said something about the caffeine. Now I was always under the understanding with the ADHD that the caffeine was like a stimulant. So it kind of worked the opposite way. Is that a myth <laughs> or is it just a person? Is it an probably... individual thing? Exactly. I imagine that it is very person dependent. Um, I know I used to be very dependent on caffeine, like most university students are. And I would drink my Starbucks every morning with, you know, the whipped cream on top and everything. It was part of my daily ritual. And when I was graduating university, I was moving into um, my Subaru Outback. I was living in the back of my station wagon for a while because I just wanted to travel and be outside and um, experience, you know, my first little snippet of van life, which is now continued to the next five years of my life <laughs> as I love van life. Um, but basically I didn't have like a set up kitchen. I just had a little camp stove and I knew that most mornings I was probably going to be eating, you know, some form of granola, like a cold breakfast. And I kind of thought to myself, if I am going to drink coffee every day, it means I either have to get my stove out every morning, which is a whole process when you're living in a car, or I have to go buy coffee, which I'm going to be spending a lot of money on coffee. I wasn't going to have any income through that time while I was traveling. So I just decided this is not practical for me right now. I'm going to quit coffee and basically quit cold turkey. I may have, I may have weaned myself off over the course of a week or so. I don't really remember the specifics, but I do remember that about a month after I hadn't had any caffeine after drinking coffee for, you know, pretty much five years every day straight. Um, I was staying with a friend and before I even woke up, she made me this like beautiful artisanal coffee with coconut milk and maple syrup and cinnamon. And I woke to this little masterpiece and was like, wow, this is so gorgeous. Thank you. Of course, I'm going to drink it. And I remember about an hour later driving my car and I could see my hands visibly shaking. And I was just feeling oh. like dehydrated. And I was like, okay, coffee's not for me. Coffee's <laughs> not your friend. <laughs> no, exactly. So well, it, yeah, it's never really become my friend again. And I'm, I'm okay with that because I have my other drinks that I enjoy, even though I love the smell of coffee. It just, it doesn't work well for me. The I don't know what they have in Australia, but there's enough Dunkins here. You don't have to actually go get coffee. You can go in and just smell it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that will work for you. You can get, get your fix that way. But <laughs> um, no, that's why I was just kind of curious. Cause I know several people that like, even my nephew included, he had severe ADHD and he, at night, they used to have to give him coffee to calm him. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, I did experience when I was in first year before I actually received my diagnosis of ADHD, which was, I think, around November, might have been late October, early November of my first year of uni. Um, 
people had been asking me like, do you have ADHD? Cause you know, my brother has it and it seems like you might have it. And I was kind of like, I don't know what's that just like very unaware of mental health at that stage. And I ended up finding some Adderall on campus and people had told me like, you know, you're going to, you're going to sit down for eight hours and study and you're not going to blink and you're not going to eat and you're not going to move. So I'm prepared for like, you know, a real stint of study. I was working on an essay at the time. I took this pill that was probably like 20 milligrams of Adderall and I was absolutely more focused for about an hour. Mm -hmm. And then it was back to fairly normal. And I remember like talking to some of my friends and being like, you know, this didn't, this didn't affect me the way that other people have said it affects them. Like maybe, maybe my brain does have that thing that it maybe needs, it's you know, some assistance to focus. So that's when I actually went to get the diagnosis, but I was still quite shocked when I received it because I, it was a new concept to me that I was unaware of. And then when it actually was accurate, I was like, oh no, but I, I can relate to the fact that some people taking, you know, ADHD or stimulants react in a very different way to, to those of us who have brains that just work a bit different. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so talk about, to tell the listeners, because a lot of people out there, I mean, it seems like bipolar is diagnosed way more than it used to be. And mm. I know I've seen like the chart, like someone asked me the other day, one of the people in my groups, and she was like, she was older and had just been diagnosed. And it was kind of like this panic, you know, I'm 60 and I just got diagnosed. And I don't know if it's from trauma. I don't know if it's ADHD. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I have that too and blah, blah, blah. And so I literally just went online and you can find all kinds of stuff that has like all of your symptoms and how they kind of overlap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's kind of like, it, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know what I mean? Like, is it the mm -hmm. trauma that caused the AD, you know, caused the ADHD? And what are your thoughts on all of that? So my thoughts are that there needs to be, and this is, this is, again, there's a lot of different theories, but this is the one that I buy into is that there needs to be a predisposition. So it, these things, you know, it is about the way that your brain is working. There's a genetic component there. Even if you have the predisposition, let's say your grandfather had bipolar disorder, it doesn't mean that you're going to experience that, that syndrome without having also a trigger that right. triggers, you know, the symptoms to come on. Um, so for me, I mean, I've only actually experienced mania that one time. Um, and I was very aware of what it was because my dad had been diagnosed two years prior, like I said. So for me, I, I'm confident I've always had the gene for bipolar disorder. My dad passed it down to me. We believe that his dad passed it down to him and probably, you know, his dad before him. And it's, it's come down through our family being completely undiagnosed until my father and now I, um, but I also believe that because of the way that I've managed to reprogram my mind, if you will, the fact that I, I, I don't really experience the severity on either side, um, you know, since I've become aware of it. Sure, there are days when I feel a little bit higher. There are days when I feel a little bit lower. To some degree, that's normal. I just have a very wide, you know, emotional capacity, I like right. to say. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm hopeful that I won't pass it on to my children even if there's a little snippet of the genetic component there, because I'm hopeful that they won't be necessarily in a position, at least through childhood, where something traumatic happens that triggers the onset of the symptoms for bipolar specifically. ADHD, I'm not so sure <laughs> because I think exactly. I've struggled with that my whole life. But right. And also, you know, you were just in a situation where when your symptoms, if you you were triggered because of your your circumstance and mm you had no, you had no support. Your dad was not like, Oh, you know, he, it wasn't a good, it was a toxic environment to begin with. So you didn't have the support. Whereas if you have children and they do have that tendency and something yeah. you know, happens, you can with a level head, talk them through it and, Absolutely. and, and help them learn how to deal with that versus being lost, confused and not knowing why the heck you're acting the way you are, you know? And right. yeah, no, that makes a whole difference, whole big difference. So talk about, I know, um, tell us about how some other examples and you say you use it as your superpower. Like, what do you coach people? What do you teach them with? Yeah, so I guess me receiving my diagnosis was one of the best things that's actually happened to me because it really, you know, lit a fire under me to to figure this thing out and to try and get well because I the thing I was really scared of, I guess, was being unwell for the rest of my life. And like, I had this fear and then it's like, okay, 
you know, veils pulled back. This is real. How do you want to face it? How are you going to act from here? So because I went on this really deep healing journey and really like, I recognize the importance of maintaining my, my self-care journey. That's something that just makes me a better person every single day. And I don't know if I would have had such a fire lit under me if I hadn't been confronted with the fact that I do have bipolar disorder and I need to, you know, stay on top of it to, to remain level essentially. So right. what I really help my clients with is learning how to build a lifestyle that is conducive to their healing journey. So I, I call myself a holistic mental wellness coach because we look at the whole picture of a person. And this means, you know, everything from your lifestyle to your relationships, to your past traumas, to what you're eating for breakfast to like, it's, it's all parts of you, what, how you're mm -hmm. speaking to yourself inside of your head. Um, this style of healing, it's not like you start taking a pill and in two weeks, you're probably going to feel right. quite better. It's more like you're putting in, you know, the daily steps every day through, you know, the program that I have is four months long and it's step-by-step step and we're learning the steps and building on top of them. Um, but it's not as if at the end of that four month program, you just go back to your old habits and mm -hmm. everything's going to be fine. It's a lifestyle that continues. You know, like I said, I started on this journey, you know, I've been on this the mental health journey for a long time, but really started on this journey when I was 19. And I still maintain those practices every single day. I'm still constantly checking in with, you know, what do I need? How can I work these things in today? You know, has it been too long since I've had a look at, you know, this one particular thing. So I essentially show my clients how to do exactly that and really build a whole lifestyle around working in the bits of everyday medicine that are going to best serve them. So give us some, some examples. Cause you said you don't take any medicine at all. Mm -hmm. So some examples say you are having an up day or your version of manic, which a lot of people would, rec you know, resonate with when they say you're in a state of mania or manic, um, what would you do to, to just keep yourself calm, keep yourself mm -hmm. level at your, at your base stage, you, as you put it? Yeah. So it's, it's similar to what I was talking about before. I actually, I mean, I haven't experienced mania since that time because okay. a lot of what I do is really, it's, it's preventative. It's okay. I'm, no matter how I'm feeling, I'm still making sure that I'm going through my motions. I'm making sure okay. I'm moving my body to get that endorphin hit. I'm focused on my nutrition. I'm sleeping enough, but not too much. Um, I'm connecting with nature and connecting with humans and, you know, remaining mindful and practicing meditation. And it's all of these things that are, are so ingrained in my lifestyle now, because for a good year, it was my priority to, to fix my lifestyle and to really like, you know, clear out the gunk and, and find natural healing. So there are days when I can kind of feel like, oh, I'm speaking a little bit faster today. I should be mindful. And that's when I, you know, I'm not going to have stimulants. I'm going to maybe do a longer meditation. I'm going to go for a run, even though I really hate running. I know it's good for me. I just don't <laughs> love it. Um, but if I have I that excess energy, I might go for a run because I'm like, I need to just do something that's going to kick my body physically and, and tire me out so that I can get a good sleep tonight. So it's just, it's still maintaining the same practices that I do every day, but just tweaking them according to kind of how I'm feeling and, you know, am I above or below where I want to be feeling at my baseline? Right. And that's, I mean, that's really normal to any, everybody has their days up and down and everything. And, and even for people that aren't diagnosed with bipolar disorder or they don't have ADHD, it's, it's about awareness. It's about what mm -hmm. you're feeling. And, you know, you know, you know, when you're having that day, when you're just really down in the dumps and the last thing you want to do is go read, you know, some soppy book. I mean, that's, you mm. know, it's like, do something to bring positivity to it, do something to counterbalance how you're feeling. And that's, that's normal in all kinds of depression. It's, you know, cause you can't, it's, you can't just make it go away. You have to replace it with right. something positive things. You can't just stop. You have to replace it. So if you've got the energy, it, you have to burn it off or replace it with something that burns that energy. But I, I just like the whole concept of using it as your superpower. And I can, yeah, I, I just love that. Yeah. Um, and I, I totally relate to what you're saying. My, my partner and I sometimes call it, um, so if I'm feeling a bit irritable or I'm just having a day where I'm struggling a bit, which like you said, we all do. And I don't know if that's necessarily bipolar or if that's just me being a human. Um, I wouldn't know any different anyways, uh, but we'll call it like, I need to get dunked. 
because I find going in the ocean um, or in a river or in a waterfall, like some natural body of water, I find that so grounding and refreshing and it just, it instantly changes my mood. So it's like, sometimes I'm having a day where I'm just like, you know, maybe I'm overwhelmed or I'm being irritable. And my partner's like, do you need, do you need to get dunked? And I'm like, yes, let's go for a swim. And just that like really quick burst of, you know, it's, it's physically grounding. You're absorbing, you know, Mm -hmm. negative ions from the earth. It's, um, it's grounding you into the time zone that you're in, into the space that you're in. It's connecting you with nature. Um, it just does such a good thing for your body and mind, both, you know, physically and emotionally. So that I know for me is a really quick, like, I just need a quick dunk in water and my whole mood completely changes and I'll, I'll go in grumpy and I come out smiling and it's like, well, there we go. I've been dunked. (laughs) (laughs) And I can see that. I know, um, I know my, my son's trying to convince me to take these ice baths and stuff. And he's like, you don't know, it's so good for your health. And, and the water doesn't get cold enough to actually enjoy the benefits in Florida. So that's not a thing, but I get that going to nature. I mean, I'm the same way. I live 10 minutes from the beach and my husband's always like, you Mm. never go to the beach. And I'm like, no, I do. Sometimes I go down there and I take off my shoes and I walk in the sand and I just, I go Mm. to the beach, (laughs) you know, it's usually when I'm by myself and I need that, just that, Mm. that relaxation or that Zen mode, just to be in that quiet nature kind of thing. Love it. Exactly. Um, what would you give to, um, I know there's some listeners out there that have children, especially that have been di- mm-hmm. recently diagnosed with um, the ADHD, especially what mm-hmm. kind of tips would you give to parents to help their children kind of deal with those daily struggles of just mm-hmm. the extra bursts of energy? Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, really listen to what your child is saying when they're, when they're experiencing, um, whether it's a frustration because they're having trouble focusing on something, or it's like, you know, an emotional outburst that comes up that seems totally unrelated to whatever's going on. Because I know with ADHD, it's similar to anxiety. A lot of the times we have just so many thoughts in our head. There's a hundred thousand things going on and there could be something in the back of their mind that's really bothering them and that they're not quite able to express. And then something happens and they have a meltdown because, this thing has come to surface and it could be totally unrelated to whatever is going on, but it can be really challenging to understand when you're not inside the brain of that person, how real and upsetting that, that thing might be that's now being triggered by this thing that's totally unrelated. Right. Um, So ultimately just really like really listening to what they're trying to vocalize and not, not dismissing it as, oh, that's funny, but recognizing that for them, it's, it's a real problem that they're struggling with in their mind um, because things can seem way out of proportion to an outside observer but to the child experiencing that thing it's very real and it's very upsetting and you laughing or making a joke of it might actually make them feel a bit worse Um, so just being really you know receptive to that and with the you know bursts of energy it's ultimately about allowing them to have an outlet for exercise that is healthy and it's not going to, you know, wind up with them accidentally bonking a dish off the table or, you know, doing something where they might accidentally hurt themselves. Um, Giving them that outlet, whether it's taking them to the playground and letting them run around or, you know, literally like basically playing fetch with them, like throw a Frisbee in the backyard and make them run for it or um, whatever sort of exercise they enjoy where they're having fun and don't realize they're burning all this energy. But then once they expel all of that you know all humans we need movement we've we've evolved always moving our bodies um once you expel that energy then you can come back and like sit at the dinner table and have a nice meal because now you're tired and you're going to get a better sleep so it's it's finding healthy outlets for kids to really burn this energy in in whatever way that looks like for them yeah i even said that to one of them i was just like walk your dog in the morning don't walk your dog after school let her walk the dog right. let her run the dog with you <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. run the dog get it out there because it's i mean i can only and i know when you got when you're ready to go and you're not that's where the focus thing for, doesn't help you're ready to go and you're in class and you're moving and you're jumping and you're you're, yeah. you're not able to focus your mind's going a million miles an hour and that's very common too of just kids with that have dealt with trauma in general you know, their mm-hmm. stuff's, stuff's coming at them a million miles an hour. So there is no focusing and it's just being, you know, teaching them to be aware and to, you know, be able to voice their, whatever they're thinking or feeling and, and right. school's not an, always an easy place to do that. So I, that's a great suggestion is just to be completely open and let the kids be honest and be open about that. 
because I, yeah. I know it's got to be frustrating and, and it's frustrating for the parent too. I can only imagine because like you said, you don't know if you've never had it, you don't know what it's like to be in that, you know, that overwhelmed state as a child. Yeah. I know. And I, I really like what you said about um, walk the dog in the morning. Um, it is, it is so essential. Like that's something I get my movement in the morning, most of the time, unless I have to start something very early for, you know, some extreme example, but um, for the most part, it's first thing when I wake up, I get my movement in because then I, I can sit down and focus rather than being, you know, super fidgety and wanting to go and do a hundred other things. It's like, once I've gotten my movement, my body can calm down a little bit. My brain can come back to more of a level state. And it, it's funny that you mentioned walking the dog because my partner and I don't actually have a dog, but um, we call it like, we need to walk the puppy. And I am the puppy. And it's like, sometimes I'm like, I just really need some movement right now. Like we got to walk the puppy, whether that means a swim or the climbing gym or a hike or whatever that looks like every single day, the puppy You're needs the puppy. to be walked. And, and that's me. Yeah. But it's like, it's same with children, you know, like they need to be, they need that movement, like walk the puppy, even if that's your child that has ADHD and needs that same sort of exertion, you know, like we, we make an effort to walk our dogs every single day. And as humans, we need that same, that same exertion. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so many now it's no, sit them down in front of the TV and don't worry about it. And if they're anxious, right. put them in a room and let them bang around and don't worry about it. But yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely essential that they get that kind of stuff. So the, wow, it's already 45 minutes. Wow. We've been talking for a while. It doesn't seem like that, does it? <laughs> so if people want to work with you, I mean, you do specific, who is your target audience? Like exactly. Is there a specific age group or what do you, what do you mostly work with? Who do you mostly work with? So if we're being very, very specific, I suppose it's, it's young women, you know, in their, their twenties and thirties who likely have either recently received a diagnosis and don't want medication, or they're just, they're struggling with anxiety and they're overwhelmed and they're not, they're not sure what the next steps on their mental health journey is because ultimately they don't, they don't want to rely on pharmaceuticals, but they don't know where else to go. Um, and I essentially show them how to, to bring this natural form of healing into their life. Um, you know, I do sometimes work with clients that are a little bit older, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's young women who are, are having those very specific struggles and kind of coping with, with their mental health and needing that extra bit of support and specifically people that are ready and willing to make changes in their life to find healing. Um, because if you're, you know, staying stuck in your old patterns and your old ways, and you're not willing to shift, then this style of healing isn't going to work yeah. because it really takes implementing and it takes, you know, doing the daily practices. Um, but it really pays off, you know, for the rest of your life when you do take on this form of healing. Oh yeah. I mean, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, you know? <laughs> exactly. And it, mm -hmm. and it's like you said, it's not just a one and done. You don't just read a book or, you know, do a, pro you have to literally implement this stuff every day and every day. It's like losing weight. You know, I could easily go on keto and lose 40 pounds, but unless I change my lifestyle, it's coming right back and I'm no more healthy than when I started. So it's, just, it's the same thing. So if someone comes to you, let's just say hypothetically, and they've just said, this is your diagnosis, this is the medicine I want you on, what would be your first step to try to avoid that medicine? Mm -hmm. So it's very person dependent. And I'm, I'm not here to say that nobody should take pharmaceuticals. Like I think it's, it's very case by case. It's your own choice. Um, you are aware of, you know, how extreme or how mild your symptoms are. And, and also you're aware of whether or not you're willing to, to put in the effort every day, because let's face it, it is easier to just take a pill every day and keep living the way that you're living. But is that the way that you want to be living five years from now? Are you going to feel fulfilled in the same sort of patterns that you're in right now? Even if your mind is, is maybe a little bit more under control because of the medicine. Um, so I would say it really has to start with a real check-in of, you know, why is it you don't want the medicine and are you actively willing and ready to, to start making changes right now so that you can start to feel better um, in a couple of weeks and a month down the road, because you do need to be willing to, to stick with it. And it can't just yeah. be like, a, uh, no, nah, I don't think I want the medicine. So I'll maybe dip my toe in something else. Like, no, you need to be ready to, to commit yourself to fully healing and to putting in the work and to, you know, learning how to love and accept yourself where you're at. That's really the place where it has to start. And I know that can be 
you know, a huge thing for a lot of people, especially when they mm-hmm. start, first receive a diagnosis. Um, the whole first module that I work on with my clients is all about self-love and acceptance because it can be scary. Like I know I went through it when I received my ADHD diagnosis, just this whole stigma of being mentally ill and, you know, feeling so unworthy of love and all of these things that were coming up around the fears I had with, with my own mind. Um, so you need to be in a place where it's okay if you're experiencing these fears you need to be ready and willing to to really work through them and then be open to potentially down the road if nothing else works for you you can revisit the medication um that was always something you know when i decided i'm not going to take it i have the diagnosis now if i need it down the road it's there but now you know 8 years into my journey i'm confident that i i will never need it um and i can continue to um uphold these natural practices and you know if if I turn 60 and things start to shift and I'm being a horrible grandmother and I need to revisit the medication thing I know that it's there but I'm also very confident that that's not that's not the life that I've laid out for myself so right right so do you you do you do anything up like like oils or or anything you know anything like that or is massages like what kind of things are you using besides just awareness and mind retraining you know what I mean? Mm. Do you use like essential oils to relax you or any, anything like that? I do absolutely love essential oils. Um, yeah, I don't use them right now as much as I have in the past, but like for sure, if I am, if I'm feeling a bit anxious in the evening, I will use some lavender and put it on my wrists, put it on my pillow, put it on the bottom of my feet. Um, I practice a lot of yoga, which I guess is still part of the mind retraining stuff, but it's, mm-hmm. um, there are, I would say there are a lot of things that I do that are just kind of my, my regular routine now, like so much of my routine is built around being outside in nature, moving my body, nourishing my body, surrounding myself with beautiful humans that I love and that love me. And, um, you know, it's all of these things that are, they're so, so simple in practice. Mm -hmm. It's just all the things that we need to be doing as humans to take care of ourselves. But, but somehow they're, they're so challenging at the same time. Like it's simple, but it's not easy. And I find a lot of people really struggle with the consistency and getting the systems in place to to make it easy to do these things. So that's where having a coach can be so beneficial. Yeah. And it, it's funny you say that because I think I've said that in probably like my last five episodes. I'm like, healing mm. is a very simple process, but it's not mm-hmm. easy. And people are like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, oh yeah, the steps are simple. It's one, mm-hmm. two, three, four, but the the actual implementation and the follow through and the the stuff that's going to come up when you're doing all this, that's the hard part. But as mm-hmm. far as can I exactly. give you what to do? Yeah, I can tell you what to do, but you got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. You got to be 100 percent all in committed, ready to do it for sure. Exactly. So, well, that's awesome. So if people want to reach out with you, want to talk to you, want to connect with you, um, how do they reach you? What's the best place? Yeah, so I would say go to my website and the first place to kind of get an idea of my work is to download my free guide. It's called the first step toward overcoming anxiety. And like I mentioned, it's ultimately all about starting to connect with that self-love and to, to learn your self-worth, to bring in self-compassion so that you can move forward on a healing journey from a place of, I want to be better because I'm worthy and I love myself rather than a place of, I want to change who I am because I don't like myself. Cause if you go that route, you're not going to to find very positive results. Um, you'll never, you'll never feel like you've made it essentially. So that's the the best place to really reach me is download that guide. Then you've got my email. Um, and you can find me on Instagram as well. Okay. And I'll have all those links in the show notes and everything for everybody to get hold of you. And then before we go, I love that you're here, Carly. I I, great conversation, but can you leave the listeners with something to take home, something tangible or your best piece of advice for them? Absolutely. So I would say the best piece of advice I can give you is to just always make the next best decision that's going to benefit you tomorrow. So no matter what that is, whether it's um, you're cooking a nutritious meal tonight and you're going to save some leftovers for tomorrow so you don't have to cook tomorrow or you're going to have a really solid evening routine tonight so you can be in bed early so you can wake up feeling well tomorrow. It's just always about putting future you but not not distant future you but like tomorrow how is this going to affect me when you have that at the forefront of your mind and that's the priority for you is feeling good the next day then the healing really does become so natural and it's just a simple let's make 
a decision today that's going to benefit me tomorrow. And if you do that every single day, it will bring profound changes to your life. Oh, I love that. I haven't had that one in 52 episodes. That's a new one. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. So, so thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have you here. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much for having me. It's been fun. Oh yeah. You're very welcome. And for everybody out there listening, listen to what she says, because that's a profound one. That's an easy one to put in place and something to think about every single day. And it will help towards your hope and healing. Have a great day.